uh, translated, we're going to talk about reincarnation, and we have an incidence in that area. Otherwise, you would not have been drawn there in the first place. So you, you had heard that something was going on. I have no way of knowing how much you heard was going on. But clearly you went up there because you were personally interested, intrigued, wanted to find out more. And uh, I, the way I look at this as I listen to you is that it frightened you or challenged you to the degree that you then turned around and blocked it out. Or in other words, you found more than you wanted to find. Well, I can't say I found more than I wanted to find. I simply would put it another way, and that is that the intimidation and the fear uh, effectively help my memory last in detail. And I found what I found. Now I can tell you, um, subsequent to that time, in the last few years, which only go back about four now, uh, I have done additional studies that I am very cognizant of, and I know very well. But to go back to 1967, mm -hmm. I can't give you the detail that I can from today. That's probably one of the first uh, um, examined uh, animal mutilation cases uh, in the country, and that's why I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about that. And, uh, and I'm glad I did. That's a remarkable thing to have done, uh, Doctor. And uh, so now I guess we can move forward a little bit. Uh, when did you come back to this whole, uh, in other words, a number of years obviously elapsed when you n not only didn't think about it, but actively blocked it out. Uh, and then at some point you came back to it again. How did that happen? The period of time from that early situation to uh, my getting back into investigational work was a period of 22 years. And during that period of time, I would vehemently deny or refuse to accept the notion that there was anything peculiar or possibly involved in in extraterrestrial behavior that could account for anything that had happened on, uh, on the Earth, or that I was involved in. I just would say, hey, this is crazy. 22 years brings us to about 1989, and I think the beginning of your relationship with Linda Howe. Doctor, I must ID the radio station, so stand by just one moment. We'll be right back to you. You're listening to Dr. Outschuler who, by the way, uh, is with us from uh, his home in Englewood, uh, uh, Colorado, and we'll be right back to him. From Jackie Gong's Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening. It's Sunday evening. This is Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. Dr. Al Schuler is my guest. He's done a lot of work in uh, animal mutilation cases. A lot of modern work, and uh, some a very long time ago, beginning with one of the first known examinations of a mutilated animal on September 9th, 1967. Now back to Englewood, Colorado, and Dr. Altshuler. Doctor, we're back on the air again. Uh, was I right? Is that about the beginning of your relationship with Linda Howe? Correct. Um, I'm curious, uh, how did Linda even know to come to you, Doctor? She had um, had heard uh, somewhat of a convoluted tale, but uh, without going into detail, she had heard that I, in fact, had been present to examine the horse lady in Alamosa 20-odd years before. And that was really the beginning and the first relatively well-documented case of, a, of an animal death that had not been clearly ascribed to uh, common or uh, clearly explainable causes. So she came to you based on not too much more than a myth. Well, she came to me having heard my name and having heard that I was 
But I had been present. Yeah. And she called me. And she introduced herself as to her credentials and so on and what her interests were. And I refused to see her, which was the right decision, I can tell you. Because at that time, my, my last desire was to be involved with any form of, of press in any form. Absolutely not. That was not my goal. Uh, I really uh, like to remain in, in a low-profile uh, situation and to do my work without fanfare, but just to do it quietly, to do it honestly, and to report what I find. Mm -hmm. But anyway, she was persistent. And one day, she turned up in my driveway. Oh. And she said, look, uh, I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes, just for a few minutes. And I felt obliged to be at least civil to her and invite her in my home, which I did. And we went down in the solarium in the house and sat down and began to talk. And we talked, I would guess, for about three or four hours. Uh, after a period of time, I uh, felt a little bit more comfortable with her and was, in fact, convinced that Linda would not do anything to publicize anything uh, that would be detrimental to me, to my work, my reputation, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I felt that I could trust her enough to be relatively candid, not completely so, but relatively so, and relatively open, which I was. And at that time, we discussed the case of Alamosa in some depth, and after that, she had continued, uh, in fact, she, she actually had made a television series several years before about uh, the alien, alien harvest kind of, and uh, she, um, I think, was well awarded for her work, which was certainly deserved. She did a, an excellent job in it, and uh, she was in the mode of continuing her investigation in the phenomena, and therefore asked if I would be of help to her if I could. And I decided in a quiet kind of way that, that I would try and see what I could do. And that's really how I got involved with her. And it began about four years ago, four and a half years ago. Uh, Doctor, how... Uh convinced are you that there is some or any connection between the animal mutilations, uh, the ones you've examined, and the UFO controversy, or are you still very much in doubt about that and thinking about it? Well, I'll tell you what I, what I tell everyone. I will give you my findings. I will tell you objectively what I think. And then you are going to have to decide on your own what conclusion you come to. You have to decide completely on your own. Uh, in a uh, situation where I am being questioned, as you have, to uh, give a, an opinion publicly of what I believe and what the relationship may be with uh, UFOs and cattle and death and mutilation and so on, I can tell you is that there are a number of findings that are very unusual. Uh, there are coincidental other situations that occur surrounding these deaths, which also are interesting to say the least. And one can come to a logical conclusion in your own mind as to whether the relationship is a real one or not. I'm not about to tell you whether it is. That's up to you. No, I don't blame you. And I can, I can assure you that there are a number of findings that are really pretty unusual. They're pretty bizarre. And if we look at the findings that have occurred in these animals that have been found, there are um, a number of them that are very, very difficult to explain in terms of what we as people, uh, enormously capable as we are in a scientific mode, are capable of doing. They're relatively well-known material uh, that 
simply would defy human capability. And the examples, or a number of them, would include, or would include one, that these animals are found in a relatively trackless area. They're found out uh, uh, and uh, found dead, you know, anywhere from 100 feet to several hundred yards or even miles from the nearest road or the nearest farmhouse or ranch home. And the animals are found without any track, vehicular track or human track of any kind. Even though the ground may be wet, difficult to understand how that happens, but it does. Is that, um, is that typical, Doctor, um, more so than not, that they're found in... Never a case. I have, I have uh, checked in a number of cases where clearly the cause of death in the animal has been predator attack. I mean, it's just, it's obvious. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to figure that out. Right. Then there are other cases in which there simply is no explanation. Uh, the animals are found in a relatively and not absolute, but a relatively bloodless environment. Uh, an animal has a tremendous amount of blood, especially if you get, uh, if you have a cow, a bull, any of the cattle, uh, the volume of blood is enormous. And to find them in a relatively bloodless field with, um, with the animals having been cut open is a very interesting event. No, no, nothing that a predator, uh, as far as you know, could, could, could even do. Well, I think, you know, a predator may have, uh, may, may drink blood for sure and, uh, and tear the meat. But what a predator will do as a rule will be, in fact, to go to the soft portions of the animal, the underbelly, yes. uh, even the eye perhaps and so on, but they will tear the tissue and generally the tissue will be quite ragged in the area of predator attack. And it looks pretty clear to me that they gnaw and tear. They don't, they don't take a bite with a sharp nose. Uh, doctor, uh, are there frequently more than one animal uh, in these trackless situations where they're way out in the middle of nowhere? Uh, have there been multiple attacks, in other words, many dead animals, or is it typically one? Well, it's very commonly one or two, but there have been cases, for example, a case a number of years ago that Linda how described eloquently in her book. Um, the, uh, Wyatt, the Wyatt Ranch, where there were five animals who were almost tail to head, five of them who were all dead with similar findings. Uh, in a relatively bloodless area, without fat, with very similar types of uh, incisional areas that were sharply baby, uh, with uh, coin out, a rancher sometimes would describe the cookie cutter type of incision that simply meant that it looked like a cookie cutter that was round that was stamped in the tissue and made a rather sharply defined cut, particularly around certain parts of the body, more frequently the anal genital area. And these are consistent. The findings at the border of the tissue show rather clearly that there has been uh, a cut at a sharp uh, border with significant heat because the changes are very typical of heat. And there, there's no question about that. That is microscopically very clear. You can tell that clearly by looking at it. All right, doctor, tissue samples or even organs removed. A um, little of this, I suppose, for some of the audience is going to get a little gory, but I've got to ask, what about the cause of death of the animal? Is that or is the tissue taking the the apparent cause of death of the animal, or has there been any investigation into that? Well, it's really a very good question. I wish I could give you an answer. I can't. I can only tell you that, that the incisions that have been made in some of the animals clearly could cause death. For example, in the, in the horn that had been uh, killed up in Alamosa, yes. the part of the animal that had been denuded from tissue was in the neck and what we refer to as the median sinum, a portion of the chest. Um, and that clearly would cause an animal to die. But it was in a bloodless area, bloodless field, which is really, to me, remains probably the single most enigmatic aspect of the entire event. The fact that there just isn't blood. Uh, trackless, you can say, well, maybe somebody is 
very, very good and can come up and start exiting from the scene of the crime, so to speak. But how they take blood away mm. is really enigmatic. Another very unusual finding, and one that is consistent and seems to present itself many times, is the denudation of tissue from bone. In other words, the removal of tissue from uh, part of the skeleton, leaving the skeleton white and clean. Now, this isn't easy to do. If you try and mimic this with our own capabilities, it isn't easy to do. It's very hard to do. I can assure you that I have personal experience in trying to remove flesh from bone tissue to, uh, to obtain skeleton parts for the purpose of studying and learning mm -hmm. uh, bone anatomy. Can you imagine a process that could accomplish that? Not anything that can be done in a matter of a few hours. I just can't envision it. Uh, it's taken me weeks to do it. And I mean weeks of boiling bone with lye and then raping it and cleaning it and sanding it and It's really not easy to do. Yes, Doctor. I recall when I was very young, I had a project in school. Um, I, I decided I was going to get a bird and boil its flesh away and take in its bone structure as a project for school. And I boiled that poor dead bird for so many hours until my mom finally made me stop. So I, I'm in sympathy with that. I, it's very difficult. It is. And yet, we find these animals within a relatively few number of hours, perfect, excuse me, perfectly alive, then dead, with clean bony bones. That is an enigma. Here's, a, here's another good question. Have you ever run into a situation where an animal has had a tissue sample taken and did not die? I personally have not, but they have been reported that some animals have remained alive for a short period of time. Hmm. Now, I think uh, Linda Howe has more first-hand knowledge in this area than I do. I have been called almost, well, virtually exclusively uh, after the fact, after the animals have been dead. And I have not had personal experience with live animals that have, in fact, been so-called mutilated or killed. And I think Linda could tell you about that. All right. Perhaps you can speak, though, to the samples that have been taken. From a medical point of view, is there any sense to the samples that have been taken? Uh, can you ascribe any sense to the areas that the samples have come from, the size of the samples, or anything else medically? Well, they the size of the samples are all they're all fairly uniform, especially when it involves the anogenital area with the genital organs frequently removed. The tongue is not infrequently removed, the ear, sometimes the eye may be denucleated and removed. Uh, the skin and the flesh along the jawbone, especially the the uh, uh, maxilla, the lower jaw, it can be cleaned of flesh and white listening quite clean, absolutely clean. Um, speculation. I have heard people continuously and uh, seem to be curious in their asking, could this be some kind of genetic research? Uh, are aliens removing these tissues and using them for research? Yes. Using them for nutrition? If that, if that were the intent, Doctor, would those samples be uh, typical of what you would want for that sort of research? That also is a, is a very difficult question to answer. And the only reason I say that, not that I'm trying to be evasive, is that the, the genetic code, which has been described for many years, it's, you know, 30 years anyway, uh, Watson Creek did that eloquently a long time ago, and there's been a great deal of additional information in the last number of years, especially in the last few, regarding changes in the code. But nonetheless, the genetic code is uniform for tissue, be it from the eye, the rectum, anal genital area, mm -hmm. chest, doesn't really matter. Uh, All right, by but these particular areas, I don't know. I, one of the things that has been published, and I assure you, not with my name on it, has been that the dissection has been so accurate that it's been able to dissect between individual cells. I have never seen any evidence for this. I've never seen it. 
I don't know how, if it were to be done, it'd be great. It'd be a very interesting thing for me to see. I've never seen it. Um, and I think the people that have, have propagated this unusual, bizarre capability are looking for a very easy way to explain what it's clearly is being done by, by alien technology. We don't have a technology to do it. True, we don't have a technology to do it, to, to dissect it between individual cells. Oh. Uh, but I've never seen that. Why specific organs are taken around the inner genital area, the tongue, and the eye, and so why do you, I don't really know. The question can come up over and over and over again. Why is this going on? Uh, there really are a number of factors that we have to consider. Number one, is it, uh, in terms of, of what we know as people and investigators, could this in fact be predator? Secondly, could it be cult behavior? Mm -hmm. Thirdly, could it be some form of investigation or research being carried on by federal agencies for whatever purpose? Well, I think you dismissed the predator theory pretty well. Uh, but, but not in every case. There, there are plenty of them that are in fact considered to be due to unknown causes and therefore people conclude alien intervention that are in fact predators. There, there are a lot of them that are, in fact, sex shots. I went down to a piece of the and it was clearly sex shots. It was sex shots. They were pop. Then the one for cult behavior, I am continually in the process of trying to learn more about cults because I know precious little about them. And there isn't that much known about them except the fact that when cult sacrifices take place, they generally go for two areas from what I've been able to learn. One of them is the heart, and the second are the sex organs because it gives courage and, and sexual prowess for the cultist to be able to be involved in eating or drinking the blood of the animal that is the sacrifice. But it seems to me that if cult behavior were involved in these situations, that they would have to do it very quickly and certainly by now they would have been caught. I mean, they never happened. There have been cults for sure that, that are involved in animal death and animal killing, and they have been caught at this time. Um, I know that in England, about a year ago, I received a call from, I think it was an investigator from Scotland Yard who called me about animal mutilation in England. And he said, you know, we have very interesting events that these phenomena taking place, but three years ago we found a group of people that were, in fact, I think in cult behavior, killing these animals, they were caught them, they arrested them, and they were still in jail. Uh, as a matter of interest, uh, in that case, since it is documented, um, what manner of mutilation was there? Were you uh, privy to that knowledge? Why was it? It would be interesting to know if the same sharp uh, incision would find you to for you. Well, there was no evidence of peace in the club of But he called me, he said that he thought that he was called because he was interested in the trees about the mutilation that were being reported from this part of the uh, side of the ocean had any relationship to what he had seen in England. And these were clear-cut mutilations with blood all over the place. And you virtually can't do a, a human dissection or killing without having a lot of blood. It just cannot be done, and I know that. If it is, I'd sure like to know how to do it. <laughs> um, so, uh, probably not the cults then. Well, you know, there may be a number of cases, but what I'm really trying to come down to is how do you explain those that are not explainable? There are those that are killed by, by sacrifice. There are those that have been killed uh, by electrocution. There are those animals that have been killed by predators. For sure. There are those animals that die of natural diseases, like bloat and other infections. There are conditions that occur in cats. What about those cases where none of these take place? Yes. Um, I take it then, in the last few years, you are frequently called when one of these comes up. You mentioned going once to Oklahoma. Do you generally uh, get there far after the fact, too much after the fact, to, to come to good conclusions, or 
Well, sometimes it's very difficult. I can, I can tell you there are a number of major problems involved with this entire investigational effort. The first one is that the ranchers and the farmers are reticent at best to tell anyone about them. It is an economic loss for these people, and you have to recognize that that is true, and that's a major factor for them. They're, they're losing substantial amount of investment when they have an animal killed. And I'm sure they have no interest in publicity over the matter at all. No interest in publicity. None. As a rule. They don't like to notify anybody, and when they do, they generally notify either one of two groups, either law enforcement groups or veterinarians. Now, let us take the example of the law enforcement people. The law enforcement people come out and they say, well, you know, this animal is clearly killed by a predator. They are hesitant to look at any other circumstantial evidence that would suggest probably not predator. Well, of course, any, anything other than predator would probably necessitate uh, some sort of further investigation. Now, I will give you a case in point. I was called to see a case uh, that was uh, involved in a horse, actually, in a county north of Denver. Uh, the rancher called me, and I went to the College of Veterinary Medicine, where the animal had been taken. I had, been, uh, I had a rather lengthy visit with the chairman of the Department of Pathology. And the only remains of that animal was kept that I was allowed to see was the head. Hmm. Brought the head out, and I examined the head, and I took tissue, and I found some interesting findings, which were including the finding of, of heat application at the margin of the jawbone where tissue had been taken. And I asked the doctor, I said, well, could you tell me how you signed this case out after a necropsy? And he said, well, this animal clearly died of baldness, which is a condition where you get torsion or twisting of the bowel that can lead to bowel obstruction and can, in fact, lead to death. No question it can. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, would you mind showing me the slide so I could look at it? Because they're fairly typical when you have a baldness and you have changes that are pretty indicative of that kind of catastrophic event in the bowel. And his reply to me was not unexpected. Well, we incinerated the animal. We didn't take any fine. <laughs> and I said, well, why not? Because in my experience, I always take tissue, always, to try and establish what I see with my eyes in gross ex examination to substantiate the gross examination by microscopic evaluation as well. And his reply to me was, we didn't need to. We saw that the animal died of bobula, torsion of the bowel, and there was no need to take microscopic tissue or take sections for microscopic evaluation. Now that would surprise me a little bit from a neophyte veterinary pathologist, but it's shocked me coming from the chairman of the department. Um, when you talk to somebody like that, do, do you, uh, do you, in essence, hear an echo of your own self in 1967? Absolutely. 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 I think you hit the nail squarely on the head. <laughs> you're absolutely right. It's a threat. Look, let's face it. It is a threat to anyone who is in a position of either requiring continuation of tenure or in a position of of uh, uh, balance where they could be ridiculed and criticized. And I can't blame them because it is, in fact, a, uh, it is a, a frightening place to be in a situation where one can be threatened. And that really hasn't changed, has it? Since well, it's changed a lot. I mean, if, if it hasn't changed a lot, don't think I'd be here talking to you. Well, that's true. And, you know, I... Uh, but I, I'm talking now in terms of uh, uh, a doctor uh, who might be encountering this for the first time. I would imagine his fears, even today, are going to be very, very much the same. 
So uh, I, I suppose. And they are, and I will tell you that the fear is unspoken, and the fear is not aired in public. And the fear, in fact, is sequestered in the deep recesses of their own minds and their own capabilities of hiding. And they do it very effectively. And I will tell you, I'm not going to give you uh, uh, names, which I, I will not do, but I will tell you this. That several years ago, I was invited as a guest speaker in a major city outside of the state of Colorado to give a talk discussing this very matter. And I presented, they were all physicians, I presented the data. I was admittedly frightened. But I said, hey, you know, I've been invited to do this, and I'll do it. And I went. And I gave a paper, an hour paper, showing the slides, showing photographs, discussing the medical and technical findings, and allowing people to come to their own conclusions, but yet giving them the option of what their conclusions might be based on the information that I gave them. And at the end of the meeting, at the end of my presentation, which was, I think, just, if I remember correctly, just before lunch, uh, I didn't have too many people come up and kind of disappeared into the woodwork. <laughs> lunch and so on. That afternoon, we had a two and a half hour workshop. There were, I don't know, 12 or so, 10 maybe, workshops. And every doctor that presented a paper during that morning session had a workshop for two and a half hours. And I thought, boy, I really, I blew this one. <laughs> and I figured that nobody would be in the workshop. And I thought, well, I'll go there and I'll just see one or two people. Well, I walked down there about 15 minutes before it was due to start, and there was a large crowd. And I got down towards the room that I had been assigned, and I could not get in the door. Oh, boy. Got in the door, and it was just, there were people sat up, there was no seating. And this was 15 minutes before it began. And at the end of the workshop, two and a half hours later, I cannot tell you, I can't begin to tell you the number of physicians that came up to me and told me about their own experience. Hmm. And it was a revelation for me. Uh, I felt more that I was among my colleagues again rather than felt like a complete outcast by noontime. Well, that's remarkable. I think that, uh, but yet I would defy you to find any physician who has had any experience to go into the doctor's lounge and surgery or anywhere else and say, guess what? This is what I believe, or this is what I saw, or this is what I've done. I'd never do it, and I don't know anybody of my colleagues, any of them that would, because it is a threat, and I think... Sure, a good way to end a career. Well, it's it leads to a lack of credibility. And that's why I have persisted and I have been absolutely dogmatic in my own presentations of saying, these are the data, these are the findings. You come to your own conclusions. I'm not going to tell you what they are. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is up to you. And I do that tonight as I have done it every other time. Indeed, and I don't blame you a bit. Um, doctor, we are at the top of an hour. And we're going to do five minutes of news, so I would ask that you relax for five minutes, and we'll be right back to you. All right. All right, doctor. T uh, take care. Dr. Altshuler from Colorado. Animal mutilations, the subject. And uh, this is some fascinating stuff. We'll be back to it in just a moment. You're listening to Area 2000 from Las Vegas. I'm Art Bell. downtown. This is KDWN Las Vegas. AP Network News. I'm Sean Anderson. President Clinton has returned to the U.S. from his eight-day six-nation European trip. His last stop was in Geneva, where he had extended talks with Syrian President Hafez Assad. Assad says he's offering Israel what he calls normal, peaceful relations in exchange for land. President Clinton is praising Assad for his overture. Crucial decisions will have to be made by Syria and Israel if this common objective is to be achieved. That is why President Assad has called for a peace of the brave. And it is why I join him now in endorsing that appeal. Israel is treating the Syrian offer as something not exactly new. Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin says Syria has indicated before that normalized relations are possible. 
The lawyer for figure skater Tanya Harding has issued a statement saying Harding, as he puts it, categorically denies all accusations that she was involved in the assault on rival skater Nancy Kerrigan. Harding's bodyguard and two other men have been arrested in connection with the case. The U.S. Olympic Committee met Sunday to discuss the Harding situation. USOC President Leroy Walker admits it's a tough case. We are troubled by this incident, which team seems to smack of uh, uh, an abridgment of the fair play concept. And unfortunately, seemingly, allegedly, has been perpetrated uh, by individuals within that same sport. Walker says he hopes the committee will decide within a few days whether Harding should remain on the team. In Los Angeles, officials say they've been talking with two gunmen who are holding a county worker hostage in the downtown Hall of Records. The gunmen are suspected of being carjackers who had led police on a chase from Central California that left four people hurt. Will there be a Beatles reunion? Yeah, 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 reports New Yorker magazine, which says the three surviving members of the group will get together in the studio next month. This is AP Network News. In pro football, the Dallas Cowboys advanced to the NFC Championship game with a playoff win over the Green Bay Packers. That story from Chuck Kelly. Frankman threw three touchdown passes, and the Cowboys capitalized on a big turnover just before the half as Dallas beat Green Bay 27-17 at Texas Stadium. Leading 10-3, the Cowboys recovered a fumble kickoff just seconds before the break, and Aikman's six-yard touchdown pass to Jay Novacek made it 17-3 at intermission. Aikman's third touchdown pass of the day to Michael Irvin in the third quarter made it 24-3, and the Cowboys move on to meet San Francisco in the NFC title game right back at Texas Stadium next week. Chuck Kelly, Irving, Texas. It'll be Kansas City and Buffalo in the AFC championship game. Quarterback Joe Montana drove the Kansas City Chiefs to three fourth-quarter touchdowns to give his team a 28-20 victory over the Houston Oilers. More than 2,000 workers at the General Motors assembly plant in Shreveport, Louisiana, could be back at work in a couple of days after the company and union reached a tentative contract agreement. The employees had been on strike since January 11th, mainly over local job issues such as work speed-ups. Army scientists have identified newly returned American remains from the North Korean War. We get details from Associated Press correspondent Ken Gillio. The Army hasn't officially released the names, but sources say the remains are believed to be those of the pilot and three crewmen of an Air Force strategic bomber that was shot down near the Chinese border in April 1951. The investigation into their fate is raising new questions about North Korea's treatment of crew members who apparently survived shoot-down. The preliminary IDs were made at an Army lab in Hawaii. They must be reviewed and confirmed by Army leaders before a positive identification is declared. The four sets of remains are among 194 that North Korea has returned the past three years. Ken Gilio, Washington. Mexico's president is offering amnesty to rebels in the southern state of Chiapas, where there's been violence since New Year's Day. President Carlos Salinas de, de, de Gotari says the amnesty covers anyone who's taken part in the rebellion up until now. In Mexico City, AP's Bill Cormier tells us President Salinas is not saying what would happen if the rebels don't surrender immediately. He hasn't made any threat. He, was, he went on TV and he said there's no reason whatsoever why the rebels should not return to their communities. However, he said that the federal government will, in the next few days, begin programs that will help the poor southern state of Chiapas. The rebels are upset over Mexico's participation in the North American Free Trade Agreement. They say due to free trade will hurt for corn and coffee crops. Forbes magazine says Arizona, Nevada, North Carolina, Utah, and Texas, also Oregon, are the states that show the best prospects for job growth in the future. I'm Sean Anderson, AP Network News. Good evening. Welcome back to Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. My guest from Colorado is Dr. Al Schuler, who's done a very great deal of work now. Uh, since 1967, before anybody else really was doing it, on animal mutilations. And back now to Colorado and Dr. Al Schuler. Doctor, are you still there? Yeah. Good. Uh, so, uh, you had a lot of physicians uh, come up to you uh, after your presentation, or in, in the second portion of it, and, uh, and talk with you. Did, did any of them, uh, or I guess a number of them, you said, admitted 
similar findings? No, not. They were not involved in the animal death situation. They were simply involved in uh, having expressed their own experiences, interpreting what I had told them about possibility of uh, UFO involvement. And they just simply told me about their own UFO experience, unrelated to the animal situation completely. Well, let me jump forward a little bit and just ask you this. Have you had any experience with or looked into the uh, human abduction aspect of this? Well, I, I've, uh, I have, uh, I have to come to you, yes. Um, is this, are both of these areas, in your view, uh, the animal mutilations and the human abductions, uh, are they both um, continuing uh, uh, valid areas of inquiry uh, with regard to the possibility of the connection uh, to UFOs? Or, uh, in other words, uh, ha ha have there been, obviously, you've reached no firm conclusions or none you're willing to talk about. Uh, Will you continue this research? I plan to continue the research, and um, I, what I really have pointed out earlier is that I am allowing people, the audience, you and others, to reach your own conclusions regarding the relationship between these events and the possibility of uh, of unknown factors, including UFO factors, I'm not. Uh, I'm not expressing my own conclusions in this regard. That um, those are mine, and and should not be. Uh, All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let me uh, let me try this angle of attack. In the investigations that you've done of animal mutilation. How frequently have there been connected observations or reports of UFO activity? Oh, I can't give you percentages, but out of the ones that have been clearly unexplained, that have not been uh, that have not been predator or uh, practical behavior or other natural causes, I would uh, make a, an off-the-cuff guess probably somewhere around 50%. There have been a number of cases that have not been anything identified or anything unusual, no unusual light, and, and other situations that have been uh, spotted unusual light that are unexplained, uh, the observation of unmarked helicopters and so on. That's a high percentage. Oh, I would say it's a fairly high, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> I'm trying to decide uh, where to go uh, from here with you. Um, I guess uh, I guess I will go here. Um, a, a related field, Doctor, is uh, this crop circle uh, phenomenon. And in that phenomenon, um, a number of researchers are discovering molecular changes in the uh, in in the crops that have been bent down in these crop circles associated with high heat which they speculate may be produced by microwave energy and uh, or that they are able to nearly or closely duplicate with with microwave energy is there any indication at all that uh, uh, that the sort of uh, uh, cuts that have been made or high heat that's been applied uh, to the animals is of the same nature You've obviously been doing some reading. Uh, the answer is, again, very difficult, and I can tell you very quickly why. If you take tissue that is alive in any animal, be it a cat, a dog, a human, a horse, a pig, does it really matter? The changes that occur in the tissue due to heat are virtually the same. Now, whether it's due to heat created by microwaves, laser, unknown cutting apparatuses, electrocautery, uh, doesn't really matter. The changes are the same. And for anyone to come and say, this is definitely due to this particular instrument or technique is virtually impossible. 
You can, however, make some relatively good conclusions regarding burned areas. Mm -hmm. They're widespread and superficial. You know that the heat has been applied by a rather widespread form of heating, for example, spilling of boiling oil or, or the flames from a burning house that burned down, that kind of thing. If you find a very precise line that is cut and sharp and demarcated, and have the changes of high temperature, you would have to conclude that somehow it has been applied by either an apparatus or a, uh, a pinpoint dedicated uh, a blade or needle or beam that could in fact apply heat in a very precise fashion. And that seems to be what I've been finding. What about the types of animals? Uh, is there one type of animal more than another that is generally found in this condition, or uh, does it run the gauntlet? It runs a pretty good gauntlet, but the majority by far involve primarily cattle and horses. More cattle than anything. But there have been pigs, there have been cow uh, cows, uh, steers of all types, uh, dogs, cats, rabbits. Uh, would you would would you think, uh, on balance, that the incidences of this um, altogether are on the increase, on the decrease, or do you see a, a constant, fairly constant number of them? Well, there was a, a pretty substantial increase at various periods in the last 20 years, and I would say now that it's. Uh, actually, about uh, about a year and a half ago, there was a marked increase, and then it kind of dropped off a little bit, and I think it's picking up again. Hmm. So it, it appears cyclical. Pretty much, yeah. Um, are you getting any help now from uh, from other uh, 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 colleagues, or are you still pretty much out there on your own? Are you uh, asking about getting... I'm at the moment, although there are a number of areas that seem to be beginning to have a little bit more of an open mind and an interest in investigation or work regarding the uh, mutilation. Well, I know this, the Bigelow Foundation, in an effort to get uh, cooperation from veterinarians has taken certain steps and uh, uh, is implementing a program to try to get better reporting on this and that no doubt is going to help. And of course the other thing is the time factor from the time something like this is found uh, until, uh, until somebody like yourself gets to make an examination. Uh, the Bigelow Foundation is clearly uh, highly supportive of the investigation. And I think it's the only research-oriented organization that is willing to, to support and help establish, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the unusual nature of these killings. I mean, the Bigelow Foundation has been very supportive and, and really, I think, instrumental to try and come to some rational and good conclusions. Nobody else seems to be willing to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's very encouraging to those of us that are somewhat involved with, with uh, the Bigelow Foundation and uh, Mr. Bigelow himself. Yes, yes, very great to have good work in this area. Um, do you know a great deal of associated with this? In other words, you hear of something that you're able to right away and uh, head toward the scene? I haven't done very much of that, but I think that may change in the future. At the present time, I've made several trips, not a great many. One of the biggest problems that, that faces me is the fact that I'm informed about these deaths days and in some cases weeks after the animals have been found. Yes. The most important thing that can really be done is to encourage people that have these things happen to them and to the animals is to notify me immediately to make the time lapse between identification of a dead animal and examination much shorter. That would be a great benefit.
What about the uh, hematology uh, that's been done? In other words, uh, with what blood there is available for you to look at, uh, have there been any, uh, have you noticed any strange uh, uh, changes at all that you, or anything remarkable about blood? I have not been able to do any immunologic studies on the blood because it's always too old. Mm. Uh, and the only findings are ones that I alluded to at the very beginning of our talk tonight, and that is the finding of evidence of cooked blood. And this is pretty consistent in the animals where the heat has been applied. You can find the, the uh, areas of uh, blood vessels with the typical changes of heat application to hemoglobin. But only in the localized area, in other words? Absolutely, only in the localized area. Hmm. Um, what about other things at the site um, uh, where the animals are found? Uh, have you noted any other unusual occurrences or changes or things in the area where the animal's found? Anything other than the changes in the animal itself? Let me tell you what has been reported. And I haven't been at these areas long enough to witness this on my own. But reported has been the fact that animals that would normally be predators do not go anywhere near the carcasses of the animals that have been killed. Oh, that's odd. And that is unusual. They don't go and attack and eat the remains, they stay away. Even though the entire may be infested with coyotes and so on and other typical predators, they don't go near the animals. Oh, that's downright bizarre. Well, it's different. Well, I should say, I mean, uh Meat is meat, and I wonder what could be different about the carcass of an animal that uh, has been affected, as you've described. Well, I wish you would tell me. I don't know. <laughs> Very odd indeed. What about um, what about any tracks, any uh, any indication of the presence of a human or alien or anything else um, around the animal? Well, it's simply not there. Uh, there have been a number of reports where animals have been seen to be taken up off the ground and then dropped after death. After death. And these reports have primarily been as a result of hypnotic regression. But you have to remember one thing that's very important regarding hypnosis, and that is uh, there, there are a tremendous number of myths that are associated with hypnotic regression. And the first one is that, that uh, you can be made to do anything the hypnotherapist wants you to do. Absolutely wrong. Uh, you will never do anything that you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, you're not in a trance. You're in a state of heightened awareness. You're aware of everything going on around you. And even more so than you are in complete conscious state. Thirdly, if the subject is particularly engrossed in the purpose of the hypnosis, the hypnosis session, or if the subject is particularly uh, fond of the hypnotherapist as a friend or somebody that they really trust and they want to please, confabulation under hypnosis is clearly uh, a possibility and can be done very effectively. Yes, I've heard that uh, flights, flights of fancy, uh, actually, under hypnosis, uh, or telling the uh, hi hypnotherapist what the hypnotherapist wants to hear. Well, absolutely, and as a therapist, it takes some skill and training to be an effective and a good hypnotherapist to learn not to lead the subject and to avoid the pitfalls that would lead to confabulation. And these are not easy. But they're essential, especially when you get in the reports of somebody under hypnosis saying, I saw an animal that was raised up into a blue beam 5,000 feet above the ground and then suddenly dropped. You know, if you get that kind of information, you, one has to look at it with a bit of a jaw to thigh in a sense. Mm -hmm. You have to really consider that this may or may not be true. Well, have the animal carcasses in the cases where there was a uh allegedly uh, it was dropped. Um, are they typically in a condition you would expect a carcass to be in that was dropped from, say, 5,000 feet? They're not dropped. I, I assume they're probably let down fairly fully. All right. They, they're, they're not uh, multi-fractured uh, carcasses with bones broken from head to toe. 
the reports that I'm aware of, and I'm aware of two of them, the animals have been dropped down, not just plucked, but have been dropped down. And in one case that I know during therapy, the, uh, the witness actually saw killing and torturing of the animal and described it with some emotion uh, in terms of torturing of the animal. And, um, you know, I don't know whether to believe that or not. I mean, I, I've seen the tape. You know, it is, it's possible. I'm not denying that it could well be true, but I'm not saying that I know for sure it is. Hmm. All right. Uh, you mentioned black helicopters, and uh, we have a lot of them here in Nevada. Many black unmarked helicopters that zip about. And uh, I see many of them in the little valley where I live, which is close to the test site, not uh, or the rather uh, what's what's called uh, Area 51. And I'm I'm curious. This moves into the who's doing it category, and the one aspect we did not cover that you offered up was the possibility that our own government for some unknown reason is doing all of this have you seen any any evidence uh, that would lead you to that conclusion well, i have to behave as a creature of logic uh, i think you would be the one that really should be interviewed by me regarding unmarked helicopters you seem to know a lot more about it than i do <laughs> but i will tell you frankly that uh, that if you look at the fact that we know, not that we speculate about, then one can come to a reasonable conclusion. And the facts are, first of all, that unmarked helicopters seem to predominate around these animal deaths for some unknown reason. Secondly, are these simply a figment of the imagination of subjects, or are these in fact reality? Mm -hmm. And if they government or something of that type, because all aircraft in the United States have an end number that identifies them, and if they're unmarked, why, they're, they're marked without marking. They have no end number to identify them. And if so, what are they doing there? Are they investigating the mutilations that are being, uh, are being done, or are they, in fact, doing them? Uh, I uh, spoke to an investigator just within the last two days or three days that told me that, again, there's been a tremendous number of sightings of helicopters, but in only one instance does he know that he's been involved in a lot of them. In only one instance does he know about helicopters arriving um, prior to the time of the mutilation. They all seem to occur afterwards. Hmm. And I, you know, I can't explain that either. The, uh, the question that you have alluded to is, are these helicopters, in fact, part of a military plot or a governmental uh, behavior to uh, do these mutilations, and if so, why are they doing them? Well, there are a number of different explanations. One of them is, yes, the government is doing them. My question to you is, why? Why in the middle of the field? The government owns a lot of profit. Why couldn't they take animals and do their chemical warfare investigation and so on in a fence off area rather than inciting the wrath and the anger and the loss by some of the ranchers. It doesn't make any sense. Well, darn, Doctor. I was going to ask you that. It doesn't make any sense. No, that's right. They have access to all the animals you can imagine they would want. Secondly, does the government have the technology to do all of these things? Uh, and if so, why don't we know that? I think the government has incredible technology which the public uh, at large or unaware. Right. But it really seems uh, problematic for me to envision uh, government personnel being able to kill an animal without blood, with sharp protection, with the typical burn patterns, with denudation of bone, the findings that are so typical, and yet I cannot see how we can do it. Maybe the government has done something that I don't know about. And very likely they may. But even again, presuming they have the technological means, why is an awfully big question. And to me, it, the other thing that has been proposed, and I've heard this said, and I haven't said it, this isn't my thought, but I've heard it said time and time again, 
that the government is doing this because there is a reality of, of UFOs, and because they recognize the reality of it, they are trying to confuse the public by launching unmarked helicopters to raise questions, to try and muddy the waters with information that isn't true. Now, uh, I, I feel that if we were, uh, if I were to be asked, and I would, and I would tell anybody who's just feeling, if I were to be asked, well, do you really believe that uh, UFOs exist? My answer to you is very simple. If you were to take every grain of sand in every beach in the entire world, think of how many grains of sand in one cup. But if you were to take it on every beach in the entire world, that you would not have the number of heavenly bodies in the universe by counting every grain. And I think that could be true. So the pure mathematics, and I've heard how Carl Sagan uh, expand on this. Pure. Uh, yeah. How can you rationally say we are the only forms of intelligent life in the entire universe? I think that's just, that, that just really is not a practical statement. Now, if one says, well, are UFOs coming down, and are extraterrestrials and aliens coming down and killing our animals and doing these things, I don't know. I'm not going to say they are, and I'm certainly not going to say they aren't. I really don't know. And why? I don't know that either. We hear that it may be for genetic research. Who knows? They say it may be nutritional. Who knows? I don't. But I think those are plausible explanations that people come up with simply to try and find some reason to explain the unexplainable. Well, if it were nutritional, one would imagine they'd take the, uh, the entire carcass or they would excise that nutritional aspect of it, not mutilate it the way you're telling me it's occurring. Well, let me let me uh, clarify your comment okay. in terms of what I look at in my interpretation. Why would they take the meat and take the entire carcass? If they really need a nutritional basis from animals, they seem to thrive on taking fluid because there's no blood around. And maybe it's the blood that they alter in some way. I don't really know. And if that is true, what better animal would there be than a large animal and a large reservoir of them? Cattle would be number one on the list, in my opinion. Okay, again, to the human abductions for a moment, there have been a lot of cases, or I guess some number of cases, of human abductions in which scoop-type samples have also been taken. And do you see any similarity, or have you even studied... Uh, these cases for similarities to uh, what you've seen done with animals? I have seen a number of subjects with these scoop-like marks on their ankles and their lower extremities. And I have so far only had one person who said to me that they'd be willing to have me excise it surgically to examine it and see if I could find any unusual findings in it. And I haven't done it because she has not volunteered in reality. Just, you know, I'll give you a piece of tissue. I don't really know that she would. But nonetheless, I have never examined the biopsy of the scoop area on the skin of a human. So I really can't answer that with any expertise. I simply don't know. Uh, my suspicion from looking at them and uh, looking at them carefully is that one would find that the covering, the epithelium or the covering over the area of scoop uh, excision would not be abnormal. The only abnormality that I would... Hello? Hello? No, I thought you were... Uh, I was cut off. No. The only abnormality, abnormality that I can envision would possibly occur would be a thinning of the tissue directly underneath the lining, which is either the, what we refer to as the papillary or reticular dermis. But I don't know, because I've never seen it. It would be a very interesting thing to do, and I would like to do it. Indeed. All right, Doctor, we're going to quickly uh, identify the station here at the bottom of the hour. Stand by just one second. Good evening, everybody. My guest is Dr. Al Chula, and we'll be right back. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. It is on a Sunday evening. This is Area 2000. You're listening to 
Dr. Al Schuler from Colorado, who's done a number of examinations, we're going to find out just how many right now, of mutilated animals. Doctor, um, I've been remiss in not asking. Uh, in the years that you have become active, uh, I presume since 1989, in contact by Linda Howe, how many of these uh, mutilations have you uh, encountered, have you examined? I think somewhere in the in the 30 range. I, I haven't really made a count, but it's somewhere in there, 30 to 40. 30 to 40. The most common aspect of them is the uh, uh, is the heat or the type of incision or the missing blood, and that, that's the most common thread that runs through them? I would say that is, yes. Now, out of all these that have done, not all of them have, in fact, been uh, unexplained. I mean, a number of them have shown no change whatsoever. So it's not uniformly that they're all typical. You know, a fair number of them are, but some aren't. Is there anything at all being published in this area, Doctor? Uh, well, not really. I, I'm, I'm currently, I'm currently writing a, a technical, a technical book to do this, and it's a labor of intensity. It's a lot of work. Um, how do you feel about doing that, uh, uh, again, from, uh, from, from the aspect of um, your career, your ongoing career? I, if I were to do this under my name, I would write the book in a completely honest and objective fashion, which is the way I'm writing it. Uh, I'm not going to make speculation. I'm not going to do anything dramatic. I'm certainly not going to appeal to the nuttiness of a lot of people that are involved in the field. You don't believe me. That, that is probably the greatest and the most serious threat, I think, to the entire area of making any effort to study the entire UFO business, is that it attracts a lot of crackpots. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are determined to become uh, publicly known and to develop notoriety and they do indeed accomplish that goal, and they do it at the expense of everybody who tries to do serious uh, research. Yes, you're right. It's a very serious problem. So it's an incredibly serious problem. And if I go ahead and and, uh, and finish writing this, which I'm really planning on doing, it will be uh, a book of, of hopefully, of credibility, honesty, and objectivity. I will present data that is irrefutable. Uh, you cannot deny certain things that I will publish. Well, I will have the proof of what I publish and welcome anybody to see it. So I, I don't think I can be criticized for being honest and telling the truth. Indeed. I think I can be criticized for jumping to conclusions. I'm not going to do that. Well, would, what kind of ex, uh, what kind of a response? Uh, you know what you're writing. Uh, what kind of a response would you expect from the scientific world uh, from your publication? Do you do you expect it to generate uh, more research and consultation? Do you think it'll bring a flood of that, or do you think they will simply absorb it and move on? Or what kind of reaction do you think you'll get? I really don't know. I would hope. Former. I would hope that it would inspire other investigators to be involved and to help. That would be my opinion. Would you like uh, consultation with other people who have perhaps um, also quietly for years done the same sort of thing? Because one, one could guess there are quite a number of people like that since there have been so many incidents. Uh, perhaps not people that have followed it and become involved as you have but people who have done singular or even multiple uh, examinations and have simply kept their mouths shut. I would welcome it. It would be great. Have you, uh, other than this program that you're now on, uh, done any uh, public work like this that you appeared on radio or television uh, uh, otherwise? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and 
such rare instances, do you find people do come to you um, after these sorts of appearances? Not really. I, I haven't yet. Um, and I would like to have some credible people approach me and be willing to help because that would be very, I think it would be very good scientifically and I, I certainly think that scientific endeavor by more than one investigator would give a lot more credence to all of them. Without asking you uh, for specifics because when I ask my question, it would be obvious why you would not give them, but is there anything that you have encountered that you would be hesitant to or would not even talk about here? Yes. I had a feeling there might be. Uh, is, uh, is this something that would be contained in the, in the book or something that you will hold on to? Well, hold on to it. Uh, well, um, all right, I guess I'll just have to let you hold on to this. <laughs> Probably should have asked the question. Now I'm dying of curiosity. <laughs> oh, I did call me on my private line and we can talk about it. <laughs> all right. Um, do you continue to consult closely with, uh, with Linda Howe? Uh, all right, what I would like to do, doctor, if I can, is open some telephone lines and um, and uh, perhaps try a few questions from the audience. Would you be up for that? All right. Uh, let's do that then. Uh, in the metropolitan area of Las Vegas, our number is 383-8255-8255. Toll free outside the state, it's 1-800-338-8255. The wild card direct dial lines are area code 702-385-7214-7214. And finally, if you have never called the program at all, you are, of course, welcome at area code 702-385-7213. My guest is Dr. Alt Schuler, and uh, he's in Colorado. And if you would like to ask a question, we are at your disposal. <coughs> Wildcard line three, you're on the air uh, with Dr. Al Schuler. Uh, yes, I'm particularly interested in uh, whether there's a signature to the to the uh, cooking of the blood, the burn marks, uh, the cutting tools that might have been used in uh, in all of the uh, earthly uh, technology. Uh, whatever tools are used, I would assume, would have some kind of signature. Could you comment on that, please? All right. Will there have been any studies along that line that you may have done? All right, thank you. Uh, any type of signature, doctor? Not really. I think uh, when you're referring to signature, you're referring to some identification uh, of the procedure. The There certainly are signatures in that sense by human technology, for example, doing what we refer to as loop procedures that are, are relatively new in the last five years or so for uh, removal of tissue in uh, gynecologic practice. Mm -hmm. It's pretty typical what you see. Again, you get application of heat and very typical kind of findings. Some of these are precisely the kind of findings that you find in, in the animals that have been dissected. Um, laser that is used in, in human surgery a great deal today, in fact, very, very commonly, has a, a signature of its own in terms of changes that are identified microscopically, and these are not found in the animal. These changes are very different because it's a different kind of heat and it's uh, over a shorter period of time, apparently, and at a significantly higher temperature, very likely. Uh, also, I wanted to follow up. Um, you mentioned that you took photographs of the original 1967 incident that got you involved in all this, and then did not have them developed, but alluded to the fact that years later, you may have uh, uh, you may have retrieved them. Uh, is that the case? That's correct. So you have those photographs now. I do. Yes, I do have them. Um, would they be something you'd publish w with your book? Very likely, yes. All right, very good. Uh, good evening on the first time caller line. You're on the air with the... Hello. Sorry. Hello. Yes, 
sorry about that, Doctor. Wild card line three, you're on the air with Dr. Alshuler. Hi. Hello there. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Reno. Reno, okay. Right. My question has to do, um, he mentioned that the uh, predators left the animals alone that had been mutilated. My question has to do with what about insects? Do they uh, come in and uh, cover the animals? That's a good question, actually, yes. Uh, doctor, thank you. Uh, yes, what about that? Uh, it is both and no bite, no mouth. I always catch more now than I could. And the one for the hunt is more. Well, there's not any sort of comment on any specific investment for the airline case until it's set up prospectus. And then even after looking at it, the fact that this kind of thing is going to be a lot of time. And it's going to be a lot of time. Now that the majority of the veterinary medical publications regarding prevention of the risk attack is involved in the predation by engines and not by large animals, there is an incredible task of limiting of large animal predators and uh, this was a great surprise. And by the way, Dr. Marvel, you have a working title for your book. No, I didn't quite know that. I'm kind of real proud of this part of the week when I came out of 2000. And the baby was to really talk about mutilation for simple animals. Yes, I'm not really sure. I haven't come up with a title yet. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, good evening. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Al Schuler. Yeah, good evening. Um, where, where are you, sir? I'm in Henderson, Henderson, and my question has to do with um, the helicopters that um, apparently monitor the sightings or the mutilization. Um, it is my understanding that they may be controlled by the Navy as opposed to the United States Air Force. Do you have any comment or any insight into that, please? All right, thank you. I've heard uh, I've heard the same thing. Oh, you have. Yes. Uh, but I really don't know. I'll tell you, I think really uh, that Linda Howe probably would know more about this and be able to comment on it with greater expertise and knowledge than I. Um, I know several people that have particularly cited these uh, helicopters, and there's one individual in, in uh, the Alamosa area, actually, who's been very involved and who I've been in touch with a great deal, who has seen a lot of them. He has mentioned to me that they're primarily Navy. And I think they may well be. I, I don't know. They may be military. I don't know who they are. There never has been any contact with uh, uh, with anybody in these helicopters or, or known landing of one in the area of one of these mutilations. Has there, Doctor? Not contact, but I do know ranchers that have shot. In fact, I've met ranchers that have shot at the helicopter oh. and have heard their bullets hit the helicopter. So they know they've hit them, uh, but they've never crashed and... Uh, Gee, that's quite an action to take. I mean, uh, one one would presume, even without a tail number, that it's a terrestrial origin of the craft, and pull out your gun and start firing it at the, at the thing is uh, quite incredible. Well, you know, the ranchers were very upset about this. Back in the early 70s, when there were uh, quite a few of the mutilations taking place in Los Animas County down in, in Colorado, the ranchers would shoot at any airplane that flew by. They'd oh, oh, at oh, boy. Uh, well, that brings on another question, Doctor, before I let it slide. Um, that is, the frequency of these incidences uh, with regard to geographic location. Now, obviously, there's more farming in the Midwest and West, uh, and cattle ranching and so forth, but is there, is there any one particular area more frequently uh, plagued with this sort of thing than another? As you mentioned earlier, there seems to be a cyclical uh, phenomenon regarding the event. Mm -hmm. There also happens to be a geographic uh, frequency that occurs at different times. For example, Colorado was very heavily hit uh, 20 years ago. Idaho, State of Washington, State of Oregon, Texas, Florida, Oklahoma. Well, that, that was going to be next. 
because they've been widespread, they've been pandemic. I have had a number of, of uh, uh, specimens that have been sent to me from British Columbia and from Alberta, Canada. They have been reported all over the world, all over Europe, Asia. Uh, it's a pandemic of uh, phenomena. It is just limited to Colorado, I assure you. All right, very good. Good evening on the first time caller line. You're on the air with Dr. Outschuler. Where are you calling from, please? Uh, Ucaipa, California by San Bernardino. Ucaipa. All right. Turn your radio off. All right. All right. It's off. Uh, all right. Good. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, my question to the doctor is, under hypnosis, did uh, he discover that any persons or agencies who may have influenced his decision to remain silent to have you been ever contacted by the uh, MIB? Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, the first question I like. Um, was there anything in the uh, in, in the hip, uh, hypnosis section, se sessions, uh, Doctor, that you went through that would indicate any outside influence? Uh, not really. I, let me... Uh, well, I will just tell you very briefly that, that I've, uh, I've had uh, really three episodes that have been fairly widely uh, uh, set apart in terms of time over the last four years. Uh, and I needn't really tell you who the hypnotherapists were, but I know that you recognize the names if I were to say them. Nonetheless, I will tell you that the experiences for me were not pleasant. They were, I would say, to put it mildly, uh, traumatic enough for me that I swore I'd never do it again. Um, I don't really recall, in fact, I, I recall everything that happened during the sessions, but not any outside influence. Uh, I, uh, will answer the second question by not answering, you don't mind. That's, that's quite all right. We'll leave them intrigued. Line two, good evening. You're on the air with Dr. Outschuler. Yeah, as a uh, avid outdoorsman, I go hunting in southern Nevada quite often, uh, the central part. Uh, is it only the uh, cattle that seem to be uh, mutilated, or could it be uh, deer also? Okay, well, we have, in effect, answered that, but listen on the air. Uh, doctor, again, uh, it's been quite a range of animals, though more frequently cattle and horses. Is that about right? Correct. But deer have clearly been involved. Deer have clearly been involved. Um, all right, fine. Let's keep moving. Good, good evening. You're on the air with Dr. Outschuler in Las Vegas. Where are you calling from, please? Coco loco, coco loco. Nowhere at all. Line three, you're on the air with Dr. Outschuler. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, is there any strange smell or uh, odor connected to these? Uh, well, I guess that's a reasonable question. I think it is. Uh, how about that, Doctor? No, not really. Um, as a matter of fact, there's, there's a, the peculiarity is really the, uh, the lack of odor. Hmm. A lack of odor. Right. Um, and, and usually you're finding these animals uh, after, after some time after the incident. Uh, how, how would you medically account for that? I really cannot because the animals that the uh, case that I did examine that was pretty obviously predator had a significant odor to it. I can assure you. So uh, there was a normal deterioration. Well, for there not to be an odor, and I'm not a doctor, <laughs> you would you would have to presume that a a normal deterioration after death was not occurring. Well, that may be a, a valid conclusion. I I think that. Uh, I have not examined enough animals at the site to really tell you from my own experience, but this is what I've heard, and I can only repeat that, but that's not first-hand evidence from me. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, good evening. You're on the air uh, with Dr. Outschuler in Las Vegas. Where are you calling from, please? Uh, San Diego. San Diego. All right. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Well, I was wondering uh, if any of these mutilations have happened to any sea animal. Oh. That is a, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Um, doctor, what about that? Sea animals. I've, I've asked the same question. And I have been told by, uh, by Linda Howe that there have been such reports. I don't know of them, and they haven't been brought to my attention, but I understand that there have been. Fascinating. So there's really, all, though there are certain concentrations, 
uh, there there is there's no specific uh, area of concentration in other words in the sea on land uh, not really uh, and I really would have to defer to Linda's expertise because she knows uh, she has uh, kept a little bit more of a of an inventory record of the unusual mutilations than I have uh, but as I recall talking to her some time ago that there was an incident or several of them uh, of sea animals, but I just can't give you any particulars. I don't really know. All right. Line, line one, you're on the air with Dr. Altshuler. Good evening. Yes, I'd like to ask the doctor, first of all, how does he spell his name? All right. Um, I, I can help you out there, or he can help you out. Do you have a question that goes beyond that? Yes, I do. But I'd like to, I'm wondering, when he mentions the lack of odor on these animals and also uh, the fact that a uh, great deal of the blood is missing. I'm assuming he's saying it's missing when there's uh, they take these uh, the parts. But what I'd like to know is, has anyone ever uh, gone ahead and uh, uh, cut one of the animals up and, and taken pieces of the carcasses and taken them quite a distance away from where they were found and left them where they could readily be eaten by predators just to see if they would be uh, eaten by predators? All right, uh, we'll ask that and spell his name for you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me give it, if I'm wrong, doctor, uh, correct me. It's John H, middle initial H, last name A-L-T as in Tom, S-H-U-L-E-R. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, doctor. Now, with regard to her question, yes. uh, it is so odd that uh, predators have not approached the carcass. Have you tried anything of that sort? Well, I haven't personally uh, tried it, but uh, I will. Uh, I will tell you that the following tale. Uh, I don't know of anybody that has taken the animals after they've been found dead and moved them to a another area that is known to be loaded with predators to see if they come near the animal. I don't know anybody that's ever done that. And that really is not a bad idea. I, I think that's certainly a, a thing that should be done. However, I know of one of the more recent uh, mutilations that took place in Colorado in the Alamos area with cattle. Uh, it was in a ranch where this particular rancher has now lost seven uh, seven cows, mm -hmm. which has been an expensive and devastating event for him. And uh, the last one, there were coyotes that came within, I don't know what the radio, I can't give you the exact feet, but very close to the, the carcass, maybe 20 or 30 people would not go to the carcass itself. And they had seen the coyotes, and they'd seen them come up and then stop and not as many posters. Why? I don't know. But that's been an observation by Chris who told me about it, and I think he's really honest. And I think he, he knows. He knows the ranchers really quite well. Well, that's really bizarre and deserves more investigation. No question about that. Good evening. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Altshuler. Yes, hi. Oh. Um, I'll tell you, I think that the government is doing it, and the reason I say that is because I know that they had UFOs because I was stationed at the Way Proving Ground, and there's a mountain there called Bee Mountain, and I used to see the UFOs go down behind Bee Mountain, and one night uh, a friend of mine and I were out at about midnight on a motorcycle, and we went up to the top of Bee Mountain and looked down into the valley where the UFO had just gone into, and there was nothing there, so that tells me that somewhere down there in that valley, that valley opened up and swallowed that UFO, and that was right on a military base. So you can't tell me that the military does not have UFOs. I wouldn't tell you that. Man. I know you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you calling? You would. Where are you calling from? Uh, California. California. All right. Well, do you have any questions for the doctor? No, I, I don't really. I've heard about these mutilations for years, but uh, ha has anything like that been done to humans? All right, thank you. Um, well, in a sense, I guess the answer would be yes. Uh, we've already commented on some of the scoop marks uh, that have been observed on people who have claimed to be ab abducted. Um, is there anything beyond scoop marks that is, is to be observed, uh, Doctor, about human abductions? Yes, uh, there are. I'd like to just have one quick editorial comment on 
uh, the uh, lady's comment. I think one of the questions that, are, that has come to her mind is, if mutilations have occurred to humans, have they resulted in human death? Because that's more favorably what one would think of. Well, have we found any in the middle of fields, Doctor? Oh, well, not to my knowledge, but I understand. And again, I am voting Linda, and I wish that she would be able to be on the program along with me because it would be uh, very valuable to have her input and hear her expertise. And I think she knows of some cases where human mutilation or human death, I would rather say, have taken place under bizarre, unusual, similar circumstances. Now, in terms of your comment of have there been any other things that have occurred to humans that are really not explained, it really comes in the area of, of three things. One is the scoop mark. And I'm not talking about the psychological effects of abduction and so on, that this has been eloquently explained by a number of other people and investigators that have done a lot of work in the abduction area. The second one is the area in which uh, people have had, quote, implants. And there have been a number of, I would like to say, uh, claims of implants. And uh, I saw a presentation by a noted author in the area of, of uh, UFO work who came himself to have had an implant. And when he showed this CAT scan on the screen, I couldn't see it. Uh, I, it could have easily been a, a part of a, a bone that was a little bit thickened. Sure. I couldn't, I wasn't convinced that he had an implant at all, but he claimed, he swore up and down he did. There have been a lot of people that have claimed that have had implants, that have had nosebleeds the following, uh, following the event of implantation of an implant. Who knows what for? Nobody really knows. Doctor, we are utterly out of time. Okay. Uh, you have been a pleasure to interview, and um, I would hope that perhaps at some future date I might do it again, perhaps with Linda Howe. That would be very nice. I'd look forward to that. Doctor, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, and have a good evening. You too, sir. Um, that's uh, a Dr. Uh, Altshuler, Altshuler, I guess it is, and uh, from Colorado. And I want to repeat this announcement now. Uh, all good things must come to an end. And so it is, sadly, with Area 2000. The Bigelow Foundation has announced it will cease funding the program as of February 6th. Therefore, that will be the last Area 2000. The reason for the series ending at this point is a concern that guests of the same caliber are increasingly difficult to find. If you'd like to express your feelings to the Foundation on this announcement, please call the Bigelow Foundation at area code 702-456-1606 or write the Bigelow Foundation at 4640 Southeastern Las Vegas, Nevada. We are uh, thinking very hard about syndicating another program, not Area 2000. We would rename it. Uh, if you have interest in getting such a program on your radio station, please contact the CBC Radio Network. Their number is area code 503-664-8829. Repeating the number for the CBC Radio Network, we're thinking of syndicating it there. Area code 503-664-8829. I'm Art Bell. Thank you for being here, and good night. The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Bigelow Foundation. This has been Area 2000, a program that introduces our listeners to the scientific approach for discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation, please call during the week between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., Area code 702-456-1606. Ask for Angela Thompson. That's area code 702-456-1606. And be with us next Sunday evening at 8 for another edition of Area 2000. From Jackie Gons Plaza, this is KDWN Las Vegas. 720 KDWN.
the following program is sponsored and paid for by the Stardust Hotel and Casino.